Hi there, salve. Welcome to Interview Insights, organized by the U.S. Italy Forum. I'm Claudia Fleasy, a journalist in Washington, D.C., and a graduate of SIAS, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, which hosts the forum. Today's conversation is with Dr. Paolo Casali, Distinguished Research Professor at the University of Texas, focusing on humanized mice, which he'll be explaining to us in more detail. His article about this subject was recently published in Nature magazine. His medical degree is from the University of Milano, as well as board certification in allergy and clinical immunology and microbiology and virology, also from Statale di Milano. Benvenuto, Dr. Casali, and welcome to the forum. Grazie, grazie finite. Mi vilegio. Okay, let's start in. Uh, if you can explain to us and to our listeners, what is a humanized mouse? I assume it's not a mouse that stands on two legs and plays the piano. So what is it? That's a very good point. Uh, humanized is sort of a jargon in that a humanized mouse is intended to be a mouse which has a 100% human immune system. The 100%. Term was, the term was coined in the 80s when uh, people were looking for a model to mimic HIV infection. And uh, that's how things started. Now, uh, Things have evolved over the last 40 years, but <clears throat> we never got to a point where the existing available humanized mice would actually mount an effective antibody or immune response in general to microbial agent or uh, man-made antigen. So this has been the rationale and this has been the motivation for us to tackle this uh, important subject and eventually come up with uh, the generation of these, of our humanized mice, which are referred to as THX mice. That's, uh, that's something that our development office came up with, not myself. I'm sorry, I apologize for my voice. Um, THS stands for true human X mice. Oh, okay. X like SpaceX. <laughs> Got it. X is used in a lot of terms. Um, right. when, when you create it, do, do you create it? Uh, you don't have to go through the specific details, but um, is this done with fetal mice or with mice that are born with already an immune deficient system? That's a very good question. The mice that are used for the construction of THX mice are virtually 100% immunodeficient, not quite 100, but almost. Uh, and they must be uh, immunodeficient because they must accept the human cells that are grafted in them. So the mice are immune deficient. The human cells are human stem cells, but not just any stem cells, but they are human hematopoietic stem cells. Hematopoietic stem cells are the stem cells that you have in your bone marrow and are the stem cells that eventually, upon proliferation and differentiation, give rise to immune cells of two main lineages, the lymphoid lineage, which comprise T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, the cells that make antibodies, and the myeloid lineage, which comprises the granulocytes, the neutrophils, and macrophages. And uh, again, are these mice that are, th these mice that are, are already born and then you inject human cells into them? Yes. So we take uh, neonate, we take mouse, immunodeficient mouse neonates, pups, within 24, 48 hours from birth and inject them intracardiacally 
meaning in the left ventricle, with purified hematopoietic stem cells from cold blood of humans. Right. Um, so just technically, isn't it kind of hard to inject cells into a newborn mouse that already has a pretty small heart? How do you it's do this? Mouse. <laughs> Actually, it's not that hard at all because the little mouse, the little pup, has no hair. It has a transparent, translucent skin. And you can actually see and palpate the little heart, the bits. And with an insulin syringe, an insulin needle, you can easily go in and inject the stem cells. Why the left ventricle? Because it's a perfect way to disseminate the stem cells throughout the body and for the stem cells to reach all those peripheral niches, which will become eventually the peripheral lymphoid organs of the, of the mouse. So you actually have to manually do this for every single mouse you... Yes, you take a little mouse like this. So this is extremely labor intensive. Well, it is and it is not. Yes, I, it's labor intensive in the sense that, of course, once humanized, these mice do not breed humanized mice, they breed mice because the hematopoietic stem cells don't make it to the germline, to the sexual. Uh, so uh. you have to create humanized mice and that's every, every time. But the, the good thing is that we keep 10, 12 breeding cages, meaning a breeding cage is two female and one male of those immunodeficient mice. And so the, uh, the, um, um, the, th those, those breeding triangles, as we refer to, actually give us pups if pups all the time, almost every day. So, oh, <laughs> and <laughs> very and prolific. A pregnant female, uh, in general, generally, will give out a, a litter of five, six, or even nine pups. And so, in, uh, in how in how much time? Well, in the delivery, just one delivery. No, oh. no, but I mean, how much time from impregnation to... Oh, there are three weeks. Uh, it's just oh, three weeks. so it's... That's a big advantage, of course. It's right. Not my... <laughs> one, of, one of the reasons for doing it with mice. Um, right. One of the terms I saw in, in investigating humanized mice is what's called the chimeric model, which is um, introducing donor cells into a non-human... Donor cells human into a non-human animal. Um, is this what you're doing? Yes. I think it, you spent too much time in America. Those are chimeric mice. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, uh, again, the mice are naturally ablated. They are naturally immune deficiency, or you have to create the immune deficiency in them. No, the, the mice were genetically manipulated, okay. manipulated to be immunodeficient. So we don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Okay, so that, that happens automatically. And they those mice carry a very critical mutation which allows for their use without gamma irradiation, which is a big advantage. Okay, because that would alter your results, I assume. That's right. We'll, we'll, we'll make the mouse weak and we'll, ah. we'll actually give rise to... Oh, too. Yes. Okay, so now now we've 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 got these mice and they've been injected with uh, human cells. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do with them? Just to explain to the lay people, you're you're experimenting with various mm -hmm. kinds of bacteria, uh, viral, and immune deficiency options. What do you actually do in one process? Actually, uh, if I may, before that, to make these mice uh, THX mice, meaning our humanized mice, 
And the critical difference between our humanized minds, there are many differences, but the very critical difference is that these mice, after 16, 18 weeks in which the stem cells, the graft takes and, and the immune system develops, the human immune system, they are, are treated, are put, are put on a estrogen diet. Essentially, low concentration of estradiol, which is the most powerful and abundant estrogen, is in the water, in the drinking water. And so the mice drink and they get E2, estrogen, estradiol. Now, that's what makes a huge difference because estrogen promotes the maturation of hematopoietic stem cells and promotes the maturation and differentiation of all immune cell elements. So the reason why these mice develop a full and, and fully functional human immune system is because they are taking in estrogen. Importantly, estrogen titles in the circulating blood are just at the lower margin of physiological range in women. The, physio, the, the, the E2, the estradiol concentration in our mice, males or females, is about around 70 picogram per picogram or picogram per ml. In a woman, during the cycle, E2 level ranges from 10, 30 to 500, 1,500 picogram per ml to 15,000 in pregnancy. So it's a very physiological level, but it makes a huge difference. And this is for males and females? Yes. Male and female mice. I'm sorry? That this is for male and female mice. Yes. They're both taking in the estrogen. Yes. And do you, do you find immune um, reactions when you're testing them different between males and females that would also be applicable for, for human research? Well, that's a very important question, and thank you for asking it. Why estrogen? Because of two things. One, there have been many, albeit very anecdotal reports by clinicians, not even a systematic study was done, that female mount much better antibody responses to bacterial and viral vaccines than men. Oh, really? Oh. Much better. Better meaning five, tenfold order of magnitudes better. Oh, Now, Cute. this is clearly an evidence which has always been overlooked and neglected. And I know by me and just another colleague of mine, uh, Barry Diamond, in, in New York, when, when I was in New York, we were closely. Uh, and we, in the late, in the early uh, 2010, uh, when I was still in California, we had three or four basic, very basic papers, one in nature, one in journal of biological chemistry, showing how certain transcription factors that are critical for the activator of genes, also critical in underpinning the antibody response, right. uh, are actually controlled by estrogen. But those were very basic uh, uh, in vitro uh, experiments, but there were those experiments that encourage me to say, why not? Why don't we try giving estrogen to these mice? And we so, did. And that made a huge difference. Now, when, you, when you're when you testing, are you testing uh, male and female mice differently for uh, the various things like salmonella or COVID or lupus? Are you testing them differently to see the male and female reactions? 
Well, the reaction is the same. It's very interesting. We tested, we created more than 500 THX mice, males and females. And uh, using stem cells from core blood of male or female babies of right. different ethnic and racial backgrounds. Oh, no. And incredibly, incredibly, there is, we never observe any significant difference in the response of our THX mice to bacteria or viral antigens or to the ability of developing lupus autoimmunity after inject one injection with pre So I think that's important because it epitomizes the critical role of the environment. When, when the stem, human stem cells are grafted in the neonatal immunodeficient mice, they develop a human immune system in a very harmonious way with the context in which they grow, which is mouse. And at the end, you do have formally a chimera. Yes, it's a chimera because you have a mouse vessel and you have a human immune system, but it's a very harmonious one. And this is why it's critical to in, in craft stem cells from the core blood, from a neonate, because one could craft stem cells from the bone marrow of an adult. Right, right, right. And this has been done, but the result is not the same. In terms of testing efficiency or? In terms, first of all, because the bone marrow cells will mount a graft versus host response that will lead to the death of the host. In other words, the host is immunodeficient. The grafted cells, human grafted cells, human host, but the grafted cells do not recognize the host as a cell. Right. They recognize it as a non-cell and they right. mount the response to the host. Right. Uh, this has happened many times uh, in the early stages of transplants of, I don't know, yes. hearts to humans or uh, livers to humans uh, where where the the human has died because of, of this kind of a reaction. So your method gets around that. Yes. But of yes. course, it's, it's, it's not hard. It's just blood. Yes, it's well, they're purified cells. Purified stem right. cells, hematopoietic stem cells, yes. You said you have uh, 500, you've, you've created 500 of these mice with, with various config uh, genetic configurations. Um, what are the financial implications of this? Isn't it awfully expensive to grow one of these mice? It is expensive, uh, but uh, um, because I, you know, I decided to start this on my 70th birthday. As I say in the briefing that is published in Nature together with the journal, the paper. And 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 that is important because I've always been well founded by the NIH. And so that's 70, that was seven years ago. And I had the liberty of using money that was gained for other purposes to fund this. And uh, and actually, the funding agency, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, is quite happy with this with the result. <laughs> right. And so, uh, to to go from the the technology itself, uh, can you describe for us some of the implications, some of the results that you've gleaned to date that that are that are practical that people can relate to? I don't know some advance in in COVID and uh, in a new COVID vaccine or some uh, new way to um, to deal with lupus, or maybe you, you haven't mentioned, but cancer is obviously an important, I mean, it's a major yeah. cause of death in the United States. Um, how, are, how are some of the practical applications being developed? What we showed is that THX mice can be vaccinated 
we purify fragelin. Fragelin is a filament which is on the surface of salmonella okay. bacterium. It can be quite nasty, and we all have it. We all have it. We vaccinated the HX with fragelin, and, and the mice mounted a strong antibody response to fragelin, neutralizing. And then when we infect the mice with salmonella, the vaccinated mice survived, cleared the infection, and survived. The non-vaccinated ones died. So that's a demonstration, a formal demonstration that THX mice can mount a mature, neutralizing antibody response and protective to a bacterium. Bacteria, yeah. And we wanted to show the same for a viral vaccine. Yes. And we went for the for the RNA vaccine because I believe. Right that RNAs will be the future of vaccines, certainly viral vaccines. And so we use the Pfizer vaccine, the Pfizer and RNA vaccine, and we use the same, we adopted the same vaccination schedule that you have that is used in humans. Mm -hmm. And indeed that induced a mature specific, highly specific neutralizing response to COVID-19, to SARS-CoV-2. Huh. So here we have the formal demonstration that THX mice mount a human, a full human, of course, antibody, specific neutralizing protective response to a pathogenic bacterium and a pathogenic virus. So you, you you've done so you've done you're you're using this for different kinds of diseases and maladies for humans, um, because cancer is so prominent in the minds of Americans. Is cancer part of your uh, research schedule, or is that different from the others? We never quite work with cancer. It has never quite been an interest in our lab. Okay, but I have collaborators here colleagues who actually study cancer, solid cancer, uh, namely breast cancer. And so they're already using THX mice to transplant biotic pieces of breast, human breast cancer into mice. And oh. then observing the immune reaction to those tumors in THX mice. Wow. So they might be a precursor to some sort of a solution or treatment for, well, uh, yeah. for breast cancer. Prostate yeah. cancer might be more of a problem. Right. Well, <laughs> of course, this is not the answer. It's not the answer to everything, but uh, um, to certainly something. Um, one one last question because uh, we try to stay in twenty minutes. Um, since these mice are artificially created. Uh, with great fatigue, um, why can't a sophisticated and an ever more sophisticated uh, computer program and AI do the same thing without having to inject into mice and, and wait for them to mature? Well, I think that, um, well, there are many reasons, but I think the main reason is that the complexity of the immune elements in a human or in a mouse and the complexity of their functions make for a, such a complex system that is many order of magnitude more complex than weather forecast. And as you know, the big computers, right? I'm down many years ago, 50 years ago. The big computers were developed first of all to deal with weather forecast. Mm -hmm. In theory, you can model anything in a computer. Yes. Problem is the power that is required for something like this is not, is not there today and is will not be there in the foreseeable future. Even oh. today, even today, weather forecast is not handled quite efficiently. <laughs> and and 
when you go to the Smithsonian in DC and you look at the Mercury capsule or you look at the moon landing module that landed on the moon in 69, right? The power of the computer that helped those poor people to land on the moon right. is probably 10 million less than my iPhone. Right, right. It's no that that is that is terrifying. And one last question. Um, there is also for some people the ethics of animal testing in two ways. One is if you are uh, what an Italian would call animalista or an American would call a peta uh, tendency uh, for because you are subjecting animals to to this kind of testing, which never ends well for the animal, never. So that's that's one series of ethical considerations, which I'm, I'm sure you deal with all the time. And the other is uh, the more sophisticated questions about the ethics of putting human cells into a non-human animal. That makes people nervous uh, for, for other reasons, other than just, oh, the poor animal, it's just, Ah, oh, what are you creating? What are you unleashing here? How do you how do you deal with those? Okay, I think you're asking two questions and you know, equally important. Well, I start from the latter. Okay. Well, smites don't reproduce, so that that takes away a lot of concerns, right? <laughs> they don't multiply. They multiply, but they multiply as mice. <laughs> Let's go back to the form, and that's very very important. But it's important in an ethical way as well as scientifically, in that the FDA, when the FDA eventually is ready to approve a drug or a vaccine, right, they will ask you to run it in non human primates. Mm -hmm. And those poor chimpanzees and orangutan, et cetera have gone through hell. Yes. And scientifically, yes, they are very close to humans, 99%, but they are not human. And we have seen this in the uh, HIV vaccine development story. The many approaches and putative vaccine didn't quite work the same way. Or they didn't work. Or they work in chimps and they didn't work in humans. So here you have an immune system which is 100% human. So it's not a model. Well, it is a model. I don't want to go overboard and to be too enthusiastic. But still, it was a 100% human system. Right. And in terms of uh, easiness of handling, obviously, Little mice, you 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 can handle little mice. Many of them, they are they are all identical genetically, the uh, deficient mice. And so uh, they allow you to do things in terms of vaccine development, immunotherapy development, testing, checkpoint inhibitors, for instance, uh, and mod and modeling. Not all, of course. My modeling certain diseases, as as you as you hinted at, in actually it's in the paper we published, just uh, with with an in, one injection of a pro-inflammatory pro-inflammatory molecule, which is bridging, this might develop a, a develop a, a disease which is really quite quite the same as human lupus. Yeah. Right. So ethically, it's justified by the fact that uh, it's for the benefit of humanity. And at least it's mice and not chimpanzees who are closer to us on the yeah, on the ethical because, scale, if you will. Because when, when, you, when you look in the eyes of a little chimp, right? At least I see myself. Right. Like, oh, for sure. Yes. 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 No. And, and, but mice do respond to tickles and they do have pain. And they communicate, and then they use some tools. Uh, yes, they are very close to us. They're, yes, yes, but but lower on. So you justify because they are 
essentially lower on the scale than say chimps so you are saving chimps in the interest of saving people well you're justifying because we are we are cruel but as our collective awareness increases yes less and less chimps less, less and less you know human primates use in fact as you know human primates are retiring they are being retired yes. in three yes. human primate heavens one right. in the one in Louisiana yes uh, and those are all retired old teams or whatever that have been infected many times with HIV with SIV semen immunodeficient virus which is very similar to the HIV or been used for many other uh, pr uh, approaches procedure experimental right. studies. Yep. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but uh, basically it's the, the wonder of the scientific research you're doing and the fact of doing this painstaking work is, is amazing. Hope, hopefully we can come back to you uh, in a year or so to find out what progress has been made. But meanwhile, grazie tanto. We thank you very much for your time and your explanation today. My, my pleasure and my pleasure and my privilege.